Okay, guys, girls, uh, I wanted to put together a, a little thing to uh, show galvanic corrosion and anodic potentials. Now, what do I mean by that? So, I've got a little sampling here. Uh, copper pipe, carbon steel pipe, uh, 3 16 stainless pipe. That's a piece of Monel over there, uh, 90 and a, and a flange, Monel 400. I couldn't find a piece of aluminum pipe because, I mean, let's face it, I've got no use for it. So I have a piece of aluminum over here. It's <laughs> a piece of aluminum strap of some kind. Anyway, I, I wanted to show anodic versus cathodic potential on the galvanic scale. I could show you a piece of paper, but, you know, the interwebs will will show you the same thing I know, which is, and, and it depends on who you, who you listen to or who did their testing. And we could get real fancy about this and read, you know, masters and doctoral thesis. Really, the point being is that zinc is at the, I always list them high to low for anode potential. So zinc would be on the very top and then aluminum you know, going down like that, all the way down to graphite and and gold. Obviously, you're never going to build something out of gold. I've seen a lot of it over the years. The idea of building something out of it's kind of silly. Although I do see a bunch of stuff built out of stainless and monel, so I guess in my world it's not that crazy. I've mixed together a electrolyte solution, a sodium bath solution. Uh, we'd call this salt water. In fact, that is what we're going to call this because we're sh we're trying to show the environment of salt water. So I've made together a salt water solution. It's in total saturation. Specific gravity is just slightly less than that of the Great Salt Lake and probably three or four times that of, of anywhere in the ocean. We could do fresh water, but that doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, energy potential. So, so what I've done here is I've hooked some leads to the carbon steel and the copper. So FeCu. I guess I could rig it up for the stainless steel and the ma nail. But what I want to show, and then I'll, I'll just hold it to the aluminum. But what I want to show is, is, depending on what two materials you have, is what what decides whether or not something's a cathode or the anode. We always refer to aluminum as the anodes mainly because that's what we're using. But if you had two identical two identical shapes, one made out of zinc and the other one made out of aluminum, the aluminum would no longer be the anode. It would be the cathode because zinc has a higher galvanic potential, higher in that the electrons would travel from the zinc to the aluminum, which means the aluminum would be protected by the corrosion mechanism of the zinc which is why we use zinc anodes in freshwater boats, but we don't use them in saltwater boats. Because in freshwater, you want something that has a higher potential because you have less energy potential in the solution itself, right? Salt water more corrosive than freshwater, so you need something that corrodes faster in freshwater. I hope that makes sense. That's the problem with a video is I, the input until people start making comments. It's not like a discussion in person, which I'm more used to having. So anyway, I'll I'll put in the carbon steel pipe, and I'll show you aluminum to carbon steel, and that would be from the anode to the cathode of carbon steel. Then if I put in something where the carbon steel is a lower cathodic value, than the other thing, then that means that the anode cathode roles would be reversed because if something is more noble, it has less corrosive potential than the other object, which means it's no longer the anode, it would become the cathode. I hope this makes sense. I've rigged up a little stand that way I, I can actually try to do this. Let's see if I can uh, set this up so that you guys can actually see the values on the multimeter. I tried using my Fluke, but apparently the screen has a high enough refresh rate that it won't actually record. 
So that was kind of a weird deal. Okay, so carbon steel pipe. I hope that's in frame for you guys. I'll step around and make sure. All right, so there's the carbon steel pipe. And I've just taped it to a piece of, of copper wire so I can do this without putting my hands in the solution and complete the electrical circuit. And then I'll, I'll start with the aluminum. Sorry. So I've got aluminum here. See if I can do this with just two hands and a stand. Seems like an 80s song. So here we go. Oh, let me reverse that so it's actually showing the correct flow from a negative to a positive, right? All right, so negative to a positive. So what is this showing us? This is showing us that the aluminum is the anode to the carbon steel cathode, right? Cathode's catching the electrons. So 360 millivolts going from the aluminum to the carbon steel. So the electricity is flowing from the negative side, the aluminum, to the positive side, the carbon steel. What does that show us? The aluminum would corrode, the carbon steel would be protected by the corrosive mechanism that's happening on the aluminum. Now leaving in the carbon steel piece of pipe, let's... and here's a piece of copper. Now I did clean off the patina so that we've got exposed bright metal. I did the same thing on the carbon steel. So now I've got to reverse the rolls because electricity is going to flow the opposite direction, isn't it? Because now instead of the carbon steel being protected, the copper is going to be protected. Can you guys see that number? 175 millivolts. And, and I reversed the leads, right? And why did I do that? Because now the electricity is flowing not to the carbon steel, but from the carbon steel. Does that make sense? Because the copper is more noble, more noble than the carbon steel, right? Iron, Fe, to Cu. The electricity is traveling from the carbon steel to the copper. What does that tell us uh, galvanically for corrosion? The mechanism is from the carbon steel to the copper, the copper wouldn't corrode the carbon steel wood, right? So now the elect the electrical exchange is happening in the essentially the opposite direction, right? Before, the carbon steel was protected because the cor aluminum was corroding. This, the carbon steel is corroding, and it would protect the copper. I, I mean, do, do you guys understand how that's working now? And, and now let's show... Let's show stainless steel to uh, the carbon steel because it has a different voltage uh, or galvanic potential, right? So here's our 316 stainless, and we still have the carbon steel in, in the solution, right? So, same thing. So, now we have a 316 stainless and carbon steel. So, the carbon steel is still being the anode, and the stainless steel is protected, right? 300 and, what's it saying? 325 millivolts. Here's an interesting experiment. Let's pull out the carbon steel leave the stainless in, and put the copper in. Now before, the copper was the cathode, and the other thing was the anode because of the galvanic potential involved. But now, when we test this, when we test this, oh, I forgot to reserve first. Now, it shows us that the energy potential is from the copper to the stainless steel because we have something that is more noble than the copper. 
So as a result, the copper now becomes the anode, and the stainless steel is the cathode, 148 millivolts. So that means the copper is actually the one that's going to corrode in this scenario, because the stainless is more noble. More noble. So it's not what the material is made out of, it's what the material is exposed to in the presence of something else. And that's why dissimilar metal corrosion, galvanic corrosion, happens at all. Because the energy potential between the two is different. And the further apart they are on the chart, whichever chart you're looking at, and like I say, then the values change depending on who did the study and what the electrolyte was in and what the material composition of the actual tested metals are and all of that stuff. So it doesn't really matter what the rates are. It's just that, that there is a difference between the two. Now here's that Monel 400. Monel 400. Oh, can I set that so that it's... Oh, I need to set that so it's above the water. Let's see. I'll just use a piece of that uh, cellulose in solid form. There we go. So now, I actually have to use the probes just directly. Now we've got Monel 400 and stainless 316, right? And now we're only talking about 47 millivolts. 46. Why? It's because Monel 400 and stainless 316 are so close on the chart that there's very low electrical exchange between the cathode and the anode, right? Now, what's interesting is using these leads, we can actually show which one is corroding faster, right? We're going from the negative to the positive, which means 316 is actually more protected than the Monel uh, at atmospheric temperatures to, uh, to point out. If we reverse those, we'll see a negative number, right? Same thing, 36 negative volts. Why? Because it's it's actually flowing the opposite direction. Uh, so anyway, s summary. Uh, galvanic corrosion happens in the presence of two dissimilar metals and an electrolyte. doesn't matter what the electrolyte solution is. It's just a matter of, does that increase the electrical exchange between the two materials? And the further apart they are on the chart, the more corrosion there will be in the object that is acting as the anode, the sacrificial material. That's all it means. I hope that uh, explains a bunch for you guys. All right, thanks.